Yes, thanks, Ian. It is, it is um, indeed, indeed a pleasure to, to introduce Peter for, for the, some of the reasons uh, that you've highlighted already. Um, but before I introduce Vitor, who, whom I have known indeed for 10 years, or I guess Vitor's age is the same of James, um, uh, I would actually like just to spend a couple of minutes on, on sort of contextualizing a little bit the effort that Vitor is, um, is going to then describe. And, and the first thing I would like to mention is, is the challenges that the, the risk team uh, had to face and had to tackle when uh, doing the work that we'll be hearing about in, in, a, in a few minutes. And, and the first thing I'd like to highlight is the fact that seismic risk around the world or the study and the analysis of seismic risk is clearly, uh, or at least it was clearly, uh, not as mature as the activities related to seismic hazard assessment. Um, I can give you just one, one simple example. If you look at seismic design codes around the world, uh, for the construction of structures to resist earthquakes, you will notice that all the seismic design codes present you with some estimation of hazard against which you have to design of structures, but practically no seismic design code asks you to estimate the risk of those structures. It is really a, um, an area that has only in the very recent years been starting to develop more and more in terms of engineering practical application. So it's clearly not as, uh, as mature as, as hazard studies. And as, as a result of that, uh, the collection of databases, and I can just quote one example, the one related to exposure, um, our activity is clearly not as mature as perhaps the collection of seismic catalogs. Um, huge challenge to tackle there. Uh, the other challenge, the other very important challenge is the fact that Construction is so different around the world. Uh, two masonry structures constructed in different parts around the world are very different from one another, and they will respond to, to, to earthquakes in a very different manner, which means that you have to really, really uh, uh, carry out a huge, a humongous effort to be able to characterize the fragility and the vulnerability of those structures. And indeed, in the effort that we'll be hearing about from Vitor, uh, 500 or more than 500 vulnerability functions had to be developed in order to study the, the, the seismic risk at this, at this uh, global scale. Um, quite, quite, quite a challenge. The other thing I would like to mention is, is something that Marco and, and, and the previous uh, speakers alluded to already, which is the need to engage the community for all the good things that have already been mentioned. And I won't uh, repeat, so I'll just say that the seismic risk team has um, engaged uh, hundreds uh, of scientists, of engineers, of researchers from more than 60 countries, and they've actually been present, they've actually organized workshops and meetings, um, technology transfer uh, initiatives, at, at least more than half of those 60 countries, which means there's a lot of traveling involved in the middle of trying to develop these models, uh, in the middle of, of, of of trying to gather the data that I was alluding to. Uh, so not quite sure how you managed to juggle all of that together, um, but that, that is, that is quite, quite, quite a significant effort, and I commend the entire team for that. Um, perhaps the last thing I will mention before passing uh, back on to Vitor, on to talking about Vitor, is, is, is the effort the team also put on publication, on publishing uh, papers with authors from around the world on peer review journals to again lend weight and lend scientific uh, robustness to the work that has been developed. And again, something that I, I find quite, quite um, commendable. So enough of me talking about uh, these challenges and these activities and, 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 and really should, um, should, should pass it on to Peter who can really provide with much, much uh, further insight on this, uh, on this uh, effort and these achie achievements. Uh, so I leave with you with Vitor. Uh, Vitor has uh, recently uh, been awarded for his work in leading the Gemris team with an um, ERI Sha um, uh, prize for, and I'll read, creativity, uh, creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurial spirit in the field of earthquake risk mitigation and management. Um, so I, I really, really cannot think, or could not think, of a, of a more suitable person to have uh, carried out 
this endeavor, and I'm really, really honored and proud uh, to call uh, Vita to the stage. Vitor. Thank you, Rui, for the very kind introduction and for the added pressure. There we go. So good morning, everybody. So I'll be presenting the seismic risk, the extension of the good work that the Azure team did to damage to, to the impact. This is actually how we started in 2015. Mark already provided, I think, a very good um, timeline of how all of this was decided from 2009 to the 2015 deci uh, decision from the governing board to come up with a global uh, seismic hazard and seismic risk. Um, we obviously try to leverage as much as possible from public available models. And of course, there are uh, models around the world for various countries, but they were just not public available. And um, so we had to do a lot of effort on this. So starting from the very basics, from the exposure modeling, so starting to develop um, uh, uh, an inventory of buildings around the world. So the journey begins actually in South, in South America, and I know that a lot of you already heard about the South America model. So this was supported by the Swiss Re Foundation, and he had a lot of partners in, um, across the different countries, mostly the Andean countries, where earthquake hazard and earthquake risk, it's, it's much higher. This was a very interesting place for us to start because we had so many challenges, very big countries, uh, relatively complex models, and um, also very high seismic risk. It was also quite interesting for us to note that um, more than 50% of the population in the Andean countries live in only 14 cities. So this really shows that we have to focus our efforts and going from national to urban risk assessment and try to improve some of the, the components of the risk model in these particular places. I also dare to say that it was quite a successful um, uh, program because we see so much um, uh, um, continuation, so, so much continuation from the local partners. And we will hear about that today from Professor Ana Beatriz uh, from Colombia. So after the program came to an end, uh, there's been a lot of seminars, there's been workshops. OpenQuake is now taught in a couple of universities. And um, we also have uh, a, a few other proposals, for instance, with Chile, which are now being under reviewed to try to continue this work into the future. After South America, we moved to um, Africa. And with the support of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, we basically start developing for the first time some of the components of earthquake risk in Africa. Africa also has a lot of challenges. As you might expect, the data is, 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 is usually not available. Um, uh, it, there's a lot of informal construction, which also presents a lot of challenges in order to model these buildings and develop vulnerability functions. Obviously, there's also the problems of capacity, of training. A lot of the people in these regions were um, introduced to, to seismic risk for the first time, and, uh, and, and it's been actually quite challenging, and it's definitely one of the reasons uh, that we have to continue putting a lot of efforts. This was a one year and a half program, as I mentioned, supported by USAID, and um, we had a couple of workshops in, um, in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, with representatives from the countries, the institutions that I'm mentioning here. In the meantime, in a collaboration with the Global Facility for Disaster Risk uh, 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 Reduction and Recovery, we've been also in Tanzania, again, trying to develop some data sets, trying to make sure that the data is available to other people. And we hope to continue uh, uh, work in this region. The workshop came to an end um, at the headquarters of the uh, Africa Union, which had a special meaning, and also allowed not just the technical and the scientists to be involved, but actually to bring a lot of the decision makers, representatives from Ethiopia, um, to participate in these discussions. We move now to something very different and with very different challenges, the United States. So with the support from the California Seismic Safety Commission, um, we also uh, started the implementation of uh, the existing model of the United States. Of course, uh, Mark already presented the well-known uh, uh, USGS 2014 model, and in particular, USERF 3 was quite challenging. But also the exposure for the United States, it's very complex. And the United States was one of the only models that we had available to port into OpenQuake, okay? Similar to what was explained for seismic hazards. 
um, there we go. So just some information. So for instance, the, um, the risk was part of FEMA 366. Um, so the risk annualized losses and uh, a detailed exposure model available for the United States. And we've worked with USGS with the pager team and we are particularly um, uh, thankful for the support from Kishore Jaiswal, which has been very patient with us in implementation of this complex model into OpenQuake. Just also some additional information about the United States. You will see that uh, the building stock of the United States, it's massive and it's going to influence um, significantly the final risk uh, of the global risk model. After the US, we went to a similar problem to, uh, program to what I just presented. So Central America and the Caribbean, this was also supported by USAID. And uh, again, we tried to follow the same formula that we use in South America. So basically contacting uh, different inst institutions um, across the region. We had a lot of events in Costa Rica and we had a, a, a very good support uh, from our, our partners there. And we have Orlando Castillo here with us. And again, um, it, it was also a region that, despite the fact that the data is actually relatively good, let's say for Central America, with some challenges for the Caribbean, um, there is a lot of informality, which again poses uh, challenges on the vulnerability modeling. And as a consequence, you will also see that the seismic risk is quite high for some of the countries. The, um, the closing ceremony was uh, in Dominican Republic and uh, uh, we're also very thankful for the people in Dominican Republic that organized a spectacular four days meeting, bringing a lot of people from Dominican Republic but also from different countries across the Caribbean and, and Central America. Um, there's also a, a lot of uh, efforts to continue the, the work that was, was done here in Central, in Central America from including um, some of the models and data sets and tools that were developed already in the university curricula to developing new seismic hazard uh, 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 for, for a few countries, including, for instance, Costa Rica, and also continu continue the vulnerability assessment, for instance, in Santo Domingo and uh, Dominican Republic. Now moving to the Middle East and the Arabic Peninsula. Again, it's a region with, with, with very differences, uh, a lot of differences. So from one side, there's countries which are almost a seismic. There's not that much seismic hazard. It consequently, the seismic risk is very low, but you also have smaller countries like Lebanon, Palestine, and, uh, and for instance, Syria, where there's a huge exposure to seismic hazard and the risk is very high. It's an old building stock and unfortunately, uh, seismic regulations are not um, uh, as enforced as they should. This is again, just some uh, statistics from the different uh, 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 components of the exposure model. We move now to Europe and South Asia. So Europe is a special case, so we were quite grateful. Uh, under the coordination of the EU Center, um, we've been collaborating under the SETA project, which will come to, a, to an end in, in 2020. A lot of, um, a lot of partners involved, involved in this project, uh, as you might expect, uh, Europe is very uh, diverse, for instance, in terms of the construction costs that we have across the different countries. We have Switzerland, Germany, uh, Norway with very high costs. We have the Balkans with um, lower costs, which also presents different uh, challenges when we want to show across an entire continent how much is the risk. I will, uh, today there will be also a poster presented by Dr. Helen Crowley. She's, she's leading, she's coordinating this working package on, on the seismic risk and the entire setup project is, is led and coordinated by ATH. Because of the setup project, it also allows us for more opportunities to exchange information, to exchange knowledge, to try to come up with a normalized uh, 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 way to do seismic risk uh, across Europe. For instance, there was an exposure uh, uh, workshop here in Pavia. There was a vulnerability workshop in Porto, in Portugal. And there will be a new version of the seismic risk across Europe uh, next year and, um, and it will be released on an event in Istanbul. It's one of the partners. It's um, uh, 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 Bogazi University in September. In South Asia, Robert, I'm putting Bangladesh and India. Basically, uh, there was no formal uh, uh, program going on there, but since India was so important to get it right or, or to try to come up with a reliable model, uh, with the support of uh, Dr. Svetlana, 
uh, deserve um, a, a good collaborator from JAM. We put together uh, a working group and we've been going, um, uh, we, we presented some of the components in IIT Bombay and then we've been doing several calls in which we present uh, exposure, we exchange some information, we improve the models, we present vulnerability, we present risk and it's been quite uh, constructive. Um, India was also quite challenging because we found types of construction that we did not find anywhere else in the world. So for instance, you can see here that we have timber mixed with soft earth. We also have mixed stone with timber. We also have more than one story moment frames built with bamboo. In India, for some of the cities, we also know that uh, uh, there's a high density of slums, a very formal construction, light materials. All of these are building classes which you don't find that often and consequently the vulnerability is not properly developed. So it required a lot of validation and required a lot of input from the working group um, across India. I'm not presenting anything here for, for Bangladesh and Bhutan, but as you might expect, we also learned a lot by working with the people from India of what could be applicable to Bhutan and uh, Bangladesh and for Nepal, I will talk later. Moving now to Eastern and Southeast Asia. So a very challenging reason, uh, a region, and again, despite the fact that we knew more or less what were the building classes that existed there, across the region you can basically find everything from high-rise, uh, code-compliant buildings built steel or concrete to very informal construction and also some mixed types. For instance, due to the climate in Southeast Asia, it's not unusual to have a first floor of mansory and the rest of the building and wood frame. Um, it's also quite an interesting place because uh, there's a lot of occupants per dwelling. So when it comes to calculating fatalities, uh, a few collapses of the buildings can lead to high fatalities as we've seen from previous events. If we move just to Eastern uh, uh, Asia, um, as you would expect, very high exposure, which will also lead to very high risk, high losses. In the particular case, we have here um, some of the, some of the uh, um, statistics for, for Japan. And, and China, and as you might expect, China is an extremely complex model. There is a lot of data available for China. We were surprised, uh, surprisingly happy with this, but basically it is stored in very different locations. Each province manages the data differently. And we had a meeting yesterday with our colleagues which are here from the China Earthquake Administration, and we will be signing a memorandum of understanding today to continue the collaboration in the region. So the last stop, uh, basically, in parallel, as we were going all around the world, doing meetings here, doing meetings in different places, also working with a lot of partners which were developing the risk models independently, um, although, of course, in collaboration uh, uh, with JAM. I would like just to point out, for instance, Geoscience Australia, which gave us very detailed information about the exposure for the entire country, also vulnerability models, and of course, the seismic hazard model. And in addition, the partners in Australia are also developing a very detailed project in Perth, which covers not just the building stock, which is what JAM is doing, it's just the building stock, residential, commercial, and industrial, but also going beyond that, in including infrastructure in this model. Also GNS Science, uh, they help us not just with New Zealand giving us uh, uh, detailed vulnerability functions and exposure, but also uh, uh, Kelvin has been helping us validating some of the countries across Southeast Asia from previous experiences from GNS. Uh, with GFZ Potsdam, uh, in particular, uh, Maximiliano Pittori, who unfortunately cannot be here with us, but he sent us uh, a very interesting poster and I recommend you to see it. This is the poster. Uh, uh, GFZ uh, have been working for several years in Central Asia and this is the, uh, the model that has been developed as part of this uh, uh, program. This is actually a region with also relatively high risk and um, uh, the engagement of the experts from the different countries, the five countries, has also been quite remarkable. Our colleagues from NSEP have been very busy also uh, developing a lot of models from very detailed 3D analysis of the existing buildings that exist in Nepal to very detailed exposure data sets which is uh, covering the entire country and uh, this is also the, this component has been integrated in the global risk model. Um, finally, I would like to mention obviously Natural Resources of Canada, so the Canadian model which has been uh, 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 developed by Natural Resources of, of Canada. This is a slide that I took from Murray. His presentations are always uh, fantastic and today I'm expecting no less, um, no pressure. 
but it's been very detailed risk assessment for a few cities, and now this has been expanded uh, to the entire country. So right now we have a uniform global exposure data sets, and there's a lot of things that we can do with this uh, exposure model. For instance, if we just look at some of the statistics, so 67% of the total buildings are only in the top uh, 15 countries. In terms of the economic value, 75% it's only in 15 countries. And as I mentioned before, uh, the United States, uh, 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 it's uh, obviously a large population, a lot of buildings, but also very high construction costs. We can also start overlaying now some of the exposure uh, information with the seismic hazard map that Marco presented previously. Okay? So if we overlay the previous uh, uh, model, we can start understanding how much are we exposed to seismic hazard. Our model includes not just the number of buildings, the replacement costs distributed across structural components, non-structural components, and contents, but also has information about the occupants. So we can start overlapping the population with different levels of seismic hazard and understand how much are we exposed. For example, 68% of the population are exposed to what we usually say uh, uh, a perceivable level of seismic risk. So at least 0.05 G for the 500 years return period calculated on rock. 42% are exposed to a level of seismic hazard which uh, uh, can cause uh, damage in buildings, 0.1 G. So this really highlights places where enforcing design regulations uh, 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 is critical. And finally, we have 23% of the world population exposed either to moderate or high seismic, risk, uh, seismic hazard. So at least a 0.2 G for the 500 years calculated on rock. Again, this is on rock. So if you bring now site amplification, site conditions, a lot of these numbers will go up because the seismic hazard is going to be higher. I also note that 23% of the world population, it's the sum of the entire population in the American uh, continent plus Europe. So it's a lot of people exposed to uh, significant seismic hazard. We can also start overlapping, for instance, the number of buildings that we have with the observed seismic hazard. So in this 3D representation, the height of the polygons, it's the number of buildings that we have in the different locations. And the color is the seismic hazard and is using exactly the same um, hazard scale that uh, you can find on the global seismic hazard map. This is only for Southeast Asia, but I would like just to show an overview of um, this part of the ring of fire. For instance, starting with um, New Zealand, uh, we can see quite high seismic hazard, huge exposure, for instance, in Manila, the Philippines, obviously Japan. We can see close to the Himalayas that all across Nepal, there are uh, uh, very big cities, but we also have a part of India that despite the fact that we have very high exposure, we don't have a high seismic risk. Moving to South America and going all the way to Alaska again, um, as I was mentioned before, South America has a lot of population focus on 14 urban centers, and you can see that the seismic hazard in some of these urban centers, it's, it's, it's very significant. Um, this can also help us to understand uh, if we have limited resources, and we always have limited resources, what are the places in the world where we should be improving the models, improving data, and doing more capacity building? From our experience working with different partners around the world, uh, we've been working obviously with uh, institutions that have the remit at the national level, but also with uh, experts and decision makers which their remit is only on cities, on metropolitan areas or urban centers. For instance, in this particular case, we are overlapping um, cities, so the size of the sphere is the population of the city, okay, and the color is again the seismic hazard. In this particular case, we are in uh, Southeast Asia. I would like to show also just a portion of Europe and a portion of um, uh, the Middle East, of course Istanbul and Tehran, uh, a lot of population and significant seismic hazard. This is, for instance, also particularly important for uh, the 100 Brazilian Cities Initiative, and we are now an official partner of this uh, 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 initiative, and we hope that some of these data sets uh, will be further improved in order to be applicable at the city level. If we move away now to the exposure and we focus uh, a bit on seismic vulnerability. So we know that buildings that are exposed to different shaking can re respond very differently. This is what we call the vulnerability, the likelihood that a building is going to suffer damage or loss. So um, 
a very big challenge was, of course, how can we really understand all the different building classes that exist around the world? We obviously have a lot of um, uh, workshops, conferences, but we also created an online tool, which is what you see here. It's on the OpenFlake platform, which allows any expert in the world to come here. I'm going to select my country. I will select my building stock, for instance, residential, and I'm going to tell you all the different building classes that you can find in my country. We collected more than 500 surveys using this approach, and this is a tool that we also use, for instance, in different workshops, okay? We obviously also collected a lot of information from the different regional programs, as I was mentioning before, from EMCA, uh, from NALSERA, and the number of building classes just keeps increasing. I can tell you that the global risk model has 497 building classes, and this is actually not enough to characterize all the different buildings around the world. Also relied a lot on existing information. Um, so more than 150 publications were reviewed. Um, a lot of World Housing Encyclopedia reports, okay, also includes very detailed information. Um, some experimental results uh, were also very useful in order to calibrate our models. Um, we also wanted as much as possible for the methodology used for the vulnerability to be uniform, to make sure that the way that the vulnerability functions they are used, let's say in Mexico, are going to be the same ones in Indonesia. So if you're doing a comparison of these two countries, the differences are as much as possible only due to the risk and not just because we use a different vulnerability, a different set of records or something like that. So um, again, uh, uh, with the project supported by USAID, uh, we had um, several meetings to try to understand what are the challenges in vulnerability, what are the methods that are applicable at the global scale and could be used to develop a, a global set of vulnerability functions. And also within SERA, uh, uh, under the coordination of the EU Center, we were also um, able to participate in another workshop just on vulnerability um, in, in Europe. From all these interactions, all these reviews, we come up with something like this. So let's use a linear time issue analysis. It's, it's 2018, computers are powerful. I think it's okay for us to do this. Let's consider single degree freedom systems, okay? We don't have the resources, time, and patience to do complex model for all the building classes, but we should be able to do something for some of them. Let's try to consider a large set of ground motion records, okay? To avoid, for instance, scaling factors below 0 0.5 and above two, which we know that can introduce bias in the results. The damage scale, let's try to make sure we're gonna use something that a lot of people out there are using. So we're using a damage scale uh, very close to what is being used by ASUS, and keep in mind that some of these damage states are not that different from, for instance, the European macro seismic scale. Also, we need to consider structural and non-structural components and also building components, and I will talk a little bit more about this. So just to explain a little bit what do I mean by the single gear freedom system. So in a lot of the publications, the experimental results, we do have the full structure, which is the complex 3D structure that you see over there. What we did, working with different experts around the world, certainly people that understand much more about structural modeling than I do, we come up with a method to convert the multi-degree freedom system into the single degree freedom system. The difference is that the complex structure takes forever to run, while the single degree freedom system can take basically just a few seconds. This allows us to use several uh, structures and to propagate, for instance, the building-to-building -building variability. For the ground motion records, we were actually very lucky because uh, due to the different activities of the seismic hazard team across the world, we had access to very interesting uh, uh, databases of strong motion. Um, we had more than, actually much more than uh, 3,500 ground motion records. These are the records which had a PGA of at least 0.05 G. We had the chance to have records from subduction, from active cello, also some records from stable continental parts. Um, we also had very strong records, which allow us, for instance, not to scale the records that much, even when we are testing code compliant structures. Usually this is the result that we have. We have a fragility function, okay? Uh, basically, it's a set of curves which give us the probability of exceeding different damage states. And with this fragility function, we can come up with something that we call a vulnerability function, which establishes a relation between an intensity measure, an IM, and the probability of loss, economic loss, or the probability of uh, human losses, okay? Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, for instance, on the human losses, okay? I cannot stress this enough. Obviously, human losses are very important, and it is not as advanced as the economic losses counterpart. 
I would like just to show you the distribution of vulnerability functions that we have that were just part of this uh, project. So we have much more vulnerability functions now in different countries. Some of the countries, the reason why there's not more vulnerability functions, it's actually because the building classes are not that different. This is usually for less developed countries, which have mostly low rise buildings and still very large um, rural areas. Moving to the final component, the seismic risk. So despite the fact that I've been showing the seismic hazard and this overlap of the seismic hazard, we did not use the seismic hazard to do the risk calculations. We took a step back and we used the seismogenic model from, uh, uh, that was used to develop the seismic hazard. We produce a lot, a lot of simulations of one year, okay? So what you see here, it's basically a simulation of one year of events, another one, another one, another one, okay? You can see this, if we could get into this time machine and every year we would register what were the events which are happening. Again, we do not do just one event because we need convergence in the losses. We need statistically uh, stable results. So basically we generated uh, on average 20,000 years per logic tree uh, branch, okay? Here I'm only showing 50 years. Trust me, we did plot um, 200 years, 20,000 years. You cannot see anything, it's just dots. So this just to show the coverages of, of, of um, uh, the, the different stochastic event sets that were generated. For each one of these events, despite the fact that I'm showing just a dot, uh, OpenQuake always models the finiteness of the rupture. And I would like to use now Costa Rica to show an example. So Costa Rica is obviously next to the uh, subduction zone. Uh, this is, for instance, one of the events that were generated in this stochastic event set that I was mentioning before. It's a massive earthquake, uh, magnitude 8.1. You can see the fault um, over there. For each one of these ruptures, we might have one ground motion prediction equation or various. I can tell you that most of the times we have a logic tree structure for the GMPs. So we have different realizations of the shaking in the region. And even for the same ground motion prediction equation, because we have a large variability, a large sigma, we also do various realizations of the shaking across the country. So let me show you some results. For instance, for this particular magnitude 8.1, if we consider the exposure in Costa Rica, okay, which I presented before, Costa Rica is also very particular because more than 50% of the building stock and population are situated in the middle of the country, in, this, in, the, uh, uh, in the valley, the great uh, San Jose metropolitan area. And these are the losses that you would expect with this magnitude 8.1. Now let's check for another rupture, a 7.1, still offshore. This is the shaking, just the median shaking from this event, and th these are the losses. And finally, for instance, this is a much more tragic event. It's a 6.1, very close to the capital, right under San Jose. This is the shaking, and this would be the losses. So this is basically repeated over and over again for the different countries, which allow us to build what we call an event loss table. Basically just a list of all the events that were generated in the country, the losses for each asset, and also the aggregated losses. So how does this look globally? So we obviously have uh, global leverage general losses for the different countries. If you look close enough, this map actually looks quite different from the one that it's on the back and the one that was shared uh, with some of you. The reason is because I'm not normalizing anything here, which means that if a building costs much more in California than it does, uh, for instance, in Addis Ababa, despite the fact that the risk might even be the same, different construction costs are going to show different results if you just focus on economic losses. So because of that, we develop this, uh, a pure average general losses across the world. But in addition, we also check the average construction costs which were available in our exposure model, okay? So for some of the places in the world, we have one order of magnitude difference between the construction costs. For instance, if we compare California, which can have costs in the order of 2,500 US dollars per square meter, and for instance, some rural areas in uh, China, which have $100 per square meter, okay? So this changes quite a lot. So basically, if we divide the average annual loss, okay, by the construction cost, then we start having something that it's a little bit more uh, uh, harmonized. Now, I know that if I have different risk values, for instance, between let's say Nepal and the United States, it's not because construction is very different or the cost is different, but it's actually because uh, now I normalize things. It's, it's a more fair, it's a fair comparison. 
As I mentioned before, we developed vulnerability functions for economic losses, but we also did the same thing for human losses, and this is the distribution of uh, uh, our global fatality um, as a, a risk map around the world. Just some interesting statistics. Once again, um, if there was a huge accumulation just on the top 15 countries for exposure, for risk, it's even more, um, uh, it's, even, it's even stronger. So 83%, for instance, of the average general losses are just on the top 15 countries. And surprisingly, we have Japan, China, United States on the top. If I normalize things, now I have a very different view of the risk. Now the United States is still there, but it's, it's, it's obviously not on the top. We have China, Japan, Iran, uh, uh, Philippines, and we have a lower percentage for the top 15 countries. On the human losses, again, uh, for the top 15 countries, it's quite interesting to see that 80% of the losses are coming from uh, only uh, 15 countries. And in fact, we obviously compare this with uh, various databases of human losses, and this is uh, unsurprisingly very much in line with past observations. A lot of these results, and this was something that I know that a lot of you requested, are basically summarized just in a one page, okay? So um, let's say that you need some quick information. You need to understand, for instance, uh, the seismic hazard, the risk, the exposure across the country, just some very general risk metrics. So we are generating for each country in the world what we call a risk profile, which is just in a one page, uh, all this information uh, uh, for the different countries. Similar to what uh, Marco presented before, we're also working a lot on documentation. This is already available online, which explains the main uh, uh, findings from the different components, also a list of the partners and the contributors for the different models. So for instance, if I want to know more about risk in Central America and uh, the Caribbean, there is information here, but there's also a list of experts from the region that now I can contact because I know they, they've been involved uh, uh, developing some of these models. Something that we've also been trying to do a lot, uh, exactly for the challenges that Rui was mentioning before, is validation and verification. We've been trying to compare as much as possible with previous events. This is, for instance, a comparison between uh, 72 events, okay, using the global uh, uh, data sets, the exposure, the vulnerability, events in which we use shake maps from the USGS, and we're comparing the number of destroyed buildings with what was estimated. This is for uh, the economic losses. Uh, um, uh, we were lucky enough that the NETCAT service from Uniqui gave us some adjusted values of losses for 2017, and we also compared what we were estimating with what was observed. Of course, in other places, it's, 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 uh, it's just illustrative. It's just some examples. You just expect a trend. Because with risk, a lot of these cities, a lot of these countries, they change so much in 30 years that you're basically comparing something that happened 30 years ago with the conditions that exist today. And even if you adjust the values based on inflation or for instance, the increase on the GDP, there's still a lot of limitations in these comparisons, uh, uh, which obviously come across when uh, uh, this, this plots. But something quite interesting is that we have now an agreement uh, with USGS. I think all of you are familiar with Pager and this basically uh, uh, the one page summary every time that a strong event happens. And uh, with the support from uh, uh, Dr. Kishore Jaiswal and David Wall, we will basically implement the global risk model within their framework. And the idea is that every time that an earthquake happens uh, in a few minutes or a few hours, we also have an estimate from the global risk model. What is the global risk model telling me in terms of fatalities, damaged buildings, collapses? And basically with this, we can start calibrating the model. We can share this with all the partners and say, this is all the things where, where we think the model is not working so well, and this is the places where we need to improve it. This is one of my last slides. So basically, um, this is where I think we are, and these are the next steps. I think this is really just the beginning because there's so much work. I was talking with some of you today, and you're asking me, are you done? And I'm like, oh, apart from that. So there's a lot that needs to be done. From improvements of data sets that basically once you can take a step back and now look at the different components you can see right away. Mm, I don't like this number. This needs to be improved, okay? Also, um, 
this uh, global risk map also created a lot, of, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of uh, motivation, even from some countries that have no tradition of doing seismic risk, but now there's, um, I think, a new, a renewed motivation to, to be involved and make sure that they start running this, uh, 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 this model. I can tell you that our mailing list of OpenFake has been very active in the, in the last months because there's so many people now grabbing all these different data sets, running the models, and checking how much are the, uh, 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 the losses. For the engagement of the scientific community and, and, and risk managers, so we've been also very lucky uh, with all the engagement we get from the scientific community, uh, all the papers that have been submitted already using some of these data sets, and a lot of the papers that will come uh, in the near future. I can also tell you that one of the reasons why the models will be developed, will be released gradually throughout the year, is because a lot of the partners that have been developing the model are in the process of writing the publications, getting them reviewed, and they prefer to have this a more stabilized model uh, before it's officially released. A lot of work on calibration, um, even if it's just making sure that more people look at the losses and see if it makes sense um, or not. Also engaging with various different uh, uh, organizations around the world and projects. For instance, the exposure data sets are in what we call the Jet for All um, uh, taxonomy, which was developed within the uh, GFDRR and uh, um, uh, uh, project, uh, the challenge funds, and now this is a much more harmonized taxonomy, and this taxonomy is being used already in other projects like Meteor with UK Space Agency. So this is basically also making sure that exposure vulnerability is harmonized, so it's easier for us to do comparisons. And of course, a lot of people ask us, what about landslides, what about liquefaction, what about tsunamis, what about infrastructure? This is all things which are, are beasts which have to be tackled. I think this is basically just the beginning, it's just a framework and it can be further developed. This is just basically some of the first steps. So I would like to thank you all and I also have a lot of personal things and general things. Of course, uh, one of the, the things is to our partners, to our sponsors, which allow all of this to happen, okay? I also want to thank all the different partners and contributors all around the world. I, I need to tell you that a lot of these people have been working with us, uh, basically pro bono. You know, they, they, they want to be involved, they dedicate their time, they come here to Pavia, we go to the different countries, they send students, we send students, and a lot of this has been basically uh, made on a, a um, voluntary basis, and I think this is quite exciting. Um, obviously, I also want to thank uh, 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 the different teams at GEM, I want to thank the Azure team, which has been crazy patient with us because we're not very good at Azure, okay? So um, they've been fantastic. I was trying to explain there's a difference in the models. Why are we having different risk metrics in the different countries? So I, I thank them very much. The IT team has been work, uh, you know, nights and days. I, I, I know that a lot of you were working until very late yesterday to produce the country profiles. Also to make sure that a lot of these models, which are extremely complex, can run and, um, and the clusters that we have at GEM, they have improved uh, uh, OpenQuake uh, uh, tremendously. Also, um, I want to thank also the, the rest of the GEM secretary, of course, the support people that uh, always allow us to uh, uh, focus much more just on the science and they, and they take care of all of this uh, for us. Uh, I also want to thank obviously my bosses. I think, I don't know if I'm easier than Marco or more complicated than Marco. I think we have a tight competition there, but our uh, bosses have been um, very, very patient. Um, of course, also my family, my, my wife and my daughter, she's over there. I think she's very confused. She doesn't understand what's going on there, but because this is being recorded, I hope in the future she'll know that I also uh, <laughs> thank her. She keep me awake at night so I could work. So, um, so with this, uh, uh, thank you very much to all of you. So, so I, I think you're getting an idea of just how mammoth this task and, and complex this task has been. Um, again, thanks for keeping to time. We've got lots of time for some questions. So, oh, it's one, is there a microphone? Uh, Vitor, this is uh, sorry, Dickie Wishiko, Oasis Lost Modeling Framework. Great presentation and, and an amazing uh, achievement for you and the whole team. <clears throat> so my question is, I like your, uh, your view of the iceberg because I think there is uh, one problem that you alluded to, which is the paucity of information that's available on a global scale across all hazards on damage information from which 
we can get the calculations of vulnerabilities. It's very hard to get. It's kept in uh, all sorts of different ways. Do you see some systemic way that we can accelerate the provision of damage information so that both for earthquake and, in fact, all perils, we've got a better chance of understanding risk on a global scale? Thank you, Vicky. So that's actually a very interesting question. And we've actually have been lucky enough, again, through a project with GFDRR, the World Bank, to um, study a lot how data is collected, basically, after, after, the, after the events. And we did notice that there's there are several challenges to that. I can, for instance, highlight the fact that every time that an earthquake happens, it's quite common that, for instance, engineers go only to the heavily damaged buildings because these are, for instance, you don't have statistic uh, stability because you don't have all the buildings, including the non-damaged buildings. And then also, of course, sometimes data is collected, but it's not publicly available. So, for instance, I think there are two, um, let's say, efforts or initiatives which might help us go in the direction that you just mentioned. One is, of course, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. I think there will be um, a stronger effort in collecting the data and making sure that this data is available. And I think there's already some interesting efforts going this direction, for instance, with this eventar, and also some uh, USAID-supported uh, um, initiatives, like, for instance, MDAT. We use a lot of information from MDAT, and it's publicly available to everybody. So some of this calibration was done with that. But this covers basically just economic losses and human fatalities. We do need the detail on, on the risk. I need to understand if this building has 100 years or it was built yesterday, if it's concrete or if it's masonry. So for instance, with this initiative that uh, the World Bank is working a lot on this, we did develop uh, uh, basically a sort of a taxonomy to try to classify buildings still in a simplified manner because we know that the people that go into the field might not have this engineering degree and also try to come up with a uniform way to do this. Uh, uh, there will be a continuation of this project, and this is being applied already to Armenia, to the Republic of Armenia. So maybe some of the lessons from here can be expanded to other countries. But I do agree that um, a lot of the work that we had to do to develop this model was almost unnecessary if there would be more da data available, and um, I would say probably in a more uniform manner. Thank you, Vitya. Congratulations also from my side. I think this is an incredible progress in global earthquake uh, uh, risk assessment. You know, I belong to those who at our zero were dreaming of a global risk model. So uh, it's there now. Uh, thank you very much. My question is related to, uh, I mean, we were, our dreams went much further. <laughs> Uh, so my question is related to the dynamics uh, uh, included in exposure vulnerability, which is much, much higher than in any uh, hazard component. And uh, uh, so uh, what do you think, for how long will that uh, map be valid? And how can you take into account uh, the uh, uh, dynamics? Would I think you mentioned that you're updating with earthquakes but is that really enough? Uh, wouldn't uh, the whole thing require a non-stationary methodology? Because as far as I understand, but maybe I'm wrong, your methodology is a stationary methodology. No? Thank you, Jochen. Excellent question. And by the way, Jochen, also thank you. Uh, also one of the founders of GEM. So if it was not for you, Ansem, Domenico, and so on, um, uh, this would not be possible. So double thank you for that. It's, that's very true, Jochen. It's, um, Sometimes, uh, uh, when, when I'm discussing stuff with the risk team, we just develop this, you know, we receive, for instance, an amazing exposure model, and then we're like, huh, let's use it for the next two years, because then there will be a new census data, for instance, for the country. There will be new data, for instance, on the commercial and industrial buildings, and you have to restart this process again. So this is very static, and I agree with you that, um, whilst, for instance, GCF has less for 20 years, okay, I dare to say that I'm not so sure if the risk is gonna last for 20 years. But this is not new for us, and this is why there's a huge framework that uh, Paul Henshaw is going to talk a little bit uh, today to make sure that, first, we can update the map quite easily, okay, so our idea is to continue updating every year, but also making sure that it's not just a static map. So there is, for instance, an, uh, an IT framework, okay, online in which people can basically see different improvements on the map and, and so on. I can also tell you that the IT team basically developed this huge framework, so the next time that we have to rerun the model, because let's say that, for instance, uh, the exposure that, uh, uh, model for Colombia was developed by, by Yafit, 
and is over there. So for instance, if you have to develop a new model, okay, then this can be just fit into the model and a new uh, uh, map can be uh, generated quite quickly. But I also wanted to touch something about what you were mentioning about the dynamic because the risk changes so much. And I also mentioned the Sendai framework before. And it is true that basically if you want to take decisions for the next 30 years and if you're making your decisions on what the risk is today, this is very limited. I can tell you that we have a person that is basically uh, studying this, basically trying to make sure that one, we can bring exposure data sets which for instance are from 2005 and for some of the countries unfortunately 2005 to whatever you would expect today based on the different costs, population growth and so on. And two, let's not stop here. Let's actually try to use the science that we develop up to here and let's also estimate the differences in exposure for the next 30 years. So basically if we're going to develop some risk measure, it should be based on the risk that you expect in 30 years and not uh, what exists today. But that's a very valid limitation and that's something that we wrote specifically on the map that this needs to be updated on the, on the regular basis. Thank you, hello. Yeah, my name's Claire Souch. I work also with the OASIS Modeling Framework and the Insurance Development Forum. I have a question about uncertainty quantification. So you showed earlier on in the previous presentation about uncertainty in the hazard model, and I had a question about how, what was the distinction between which countries have what quantification on hazard? And then my second question is, is uncertainty, is there an expression of uncertainty expressed through into the risk curves? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Claire. Very, very good question. So yes, uh, uh, uncertainty is massive. And uh, interestingly enough, sometimes you almost feel like a lower variability in countries with less data because the models are relatively simple than countries with a lot of data in which you have huge epistemic uncertainty, for instance, on the, on the seismogenic model, like it's the case of the surgery. So I, we have two ways to tackle this and to communicate this. The first one is something that I presented in previous occasions. We had uh, two reviews of, uh, before this, we had two reviews of the global risk model and we presented a way to classify the different countries. We called it a reliability index and it's basically the sum of the reliability that you have on the hazard, on the exposure, and on the vulnerability. So for instance, for countries like New Zealand, like the United States, like Australia, hazard models developed by the country, exposure developed by the country, a lot of uh, uh, good data and vulnerability, this has a high reliability index. For other places, we have lower reliability index, which I think is also quite interesting because it allows you to understand, oh, these are the places where we have to invest in data collection. But this is obviously very qualitative still doesn't tell you mm, this mm -hmm. might be uh, a huge variability or not. We did not have time to do a lot of this sensitivity analysis. We have some, and we publish about this. But this was also a criticism that uh, uh, was heard during the, uh, one of the reviews of the SETA model. I think it was actually Mauro and, uh, and Helen Crowley, she's also here. And we've been discussing about, let's actually try to properly model all the differences, all the variabilities that we have on the different components. Let's propagate this until the end and then see how much are the, the variability on, on the left results. So for instance, I can tell you there's a lot of expert opinion when it comes to the building fraction, like what I was showing before. So if you ask different people, they would give you different fractions. So the idea is to try to model this um, and see how much is it affecting the final result. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, uh, Marco, for all this work. Very impressive. Um, Fabrice Coton from uh, Geoforsting Centrum uh, in Potsdam. For years, I have the GSHAT map in my office, and each morning this map has been a strong motivation to, to work because the map is showing that there are red areas close to Istanbul, red areas close to the San Andreas Fault, so, and that most of the planet is uh, red or orange, so high seismic risk. The maps that we have been showing this morning are mostly showing blue, green, light, yellow, some part of the world with, uh, with, with red, but I have the feeling that perhaps those maps are not communicating risks at the, at the right level. Those maps may show that most of the world is safe from a seismic risk of, of uh, point of view. Is it really what we want to show? In other words, I think that, and we had only a couple of days to react, and you know that we already have been exchanging emails, but I think before we deliver the final versions, perhaps we should think a little bit on the way we should communicate risk the right, uh, and using the right colors, using the right scale, using the right uh, features. Thank you, Fabrice. I will obviously, uh, uh, Marco can uh, answer to, to the other part. I can tell you that the risk, um, 
might be a little bit different because um, if there's no exposure, there's no risk, you know, so there's very little that we can do about that. I can also tell you that, for instance, when you're looking at the global scale uh, on, on the risk level, some of the cities are very, very heavily populated, but they are, for instance, a thousand square kilometers. So when you look at the planet, it's still a, a dot uh, that you have there. Uh, we did try a gazillion different techniques uh, 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 to show this. I shared several maps, several ways of, of trying to present the risk from using different polygons, from using different symbols that we have for the different cities. And this is probably something that we can uh, 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 do in the future. But um, we also understood that, for instance, a lot of these data sets are actually on the, on the platform. And nowadays, I think people use much more the digital versions of, 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 of these documents than, than just a paper form. And in a lot of this, um, uh, a lot of these documents allow people to zoom in and to see the risk. I will also tell you that, for instance, if you look at the maps and uh, take, take Canada, for instance, it's a very big country, but it's very sparsely populated. So the fact that you need to show on the same color scale um, countries like, for instance, let's say Italy that has high risk and then also and densely populated and then also Canada, it's, it's, it's a very fragile balance. But for instance, this is also one of the reasons we did the country profiles, because on the country profiles, the color scale has been adjusted to the maximum and minimum that you can find on the country. And this way you have a more, let's say, national view of the risk. So regarding the color map, um, certainly uh, um, we are open to, to, go to explore various options. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, on the website, uh, we can even consider the possibility of having various color scales uh, depending on the type of message that we want to transfer to, to, to the user, okay? So depending on that, uh, we can decide to have different color scales uh, and, and therefore, uh, give a different message depending on the type of user that, uh, that is um, trying to get information through the website. Um, what I try to explain in my presentation is that um, th there's an important uh, step that we need to, to take. We need to abandon the concept of having the, the map on your wall in your office uh, and focus more on an object that will keep on changing and that will have the possibility of transferring more information through the web rather than on a map uh, that in, uh, in less than one year will be outdated. Um, for the hazard, I can guarantee that because, for example, Graham approached me right before the talk and he told me that there's already another new model for Papua New Guinea that will be released soon. So that means that in, in, a, in a few months, we will have a new model with new information already available. But the, the, the point on the color scale is well taken. And I'm keen to explore uh, different options and come up with some solutions, again, depending and trying to accommodate different requirements that are coming from the users. But let's not forget, and that's, sorry, <laughs> then I will let you. One important point uh, that I think we need to take into account is that now we don't have just the hazard map. The hazard map uh, doesn't have the same function that had in the past of also explaining where we have the risk. Because for the risk, there is the risk map. So for the other map, I think it's important to make sure that we explain clearly the differences in the values of hazard that we have in various parts of the world. Thank you. No, I was just gonna say, I think, I think part of the things about going to be about dissemination, and so probably these points will be getting picked up. Rui's got a point, and then I think there's gonna be a question there. Rui, Yes, th thank you, Ian. Just one, one quick question, Peter. Um, uh, when I was sort of introducing your talk, I mentioned how practicing engineers have not been asked over the, over the years to assess the risk of buildings. And, but th this is a trend, also thanks to the efforts of GEM, and, and, and not only the Sendai framework and, and, and a lot, this is a, a trend that is starting to change. So my question to you is, uh, do you feel that from a user-friendliness point of view, the tools, open quick tools, the, the tools and methodologies that have been developed by GEM over these years can now compare themselves in terms of user-friendliness to the structural analysis tools that practice engineers have been so accustomed to use for the past, uh, for the past decades. Thank you, Rui, that's, that's very well taken. Um, in a lot of the workshops, a lot of the meetings that we do, once we start explaining things, people are like, Oh, SAP is so much easier to use. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we still, have a, we still have a long way to go in terms of trying to improve the user friendliness. 
I can tell you that um, in the past, when we were doing these workshops in different places, I think you've been in some of these workshops, we had easily like an entire morning to set up everything, right? To install software, to start people, you know, resolve all the issues and so on. We did some interesting, for instance, meetings uh, organized by Yafit in Medellin. We had like 70 people on them or less, even more. And then uh, in Bogota also with, with a lot of people and um, it's been much, much easier. So basically in a matter of one hour, people can install OpenQuake and, and less than that, they can also install, for instance, a plugin for QGIS. So basically just user interface so people now can basically click here, click over there to try to run the risk. If I want to see maps and curves right away, there's also these options. And I think this is less intimidating for people. And I think this is also helping to see earthquake risk more like what practitioners should be doing and not so much what universities alone um, uh, should be doing. And uh, we also know that capacity differences significantly around the world. I can tell you in, in some of the workshops, for instance, we have our colleagues from Japan they don't care about the user interface. They go command line and they just do things much faster than I can do. But for other people, the user interface has been really, really in the gap. But usually at the end of, of all the workshops, and I know a lot of you have been in this workshop, uh, we, we give this survey for people to tell us what should be improved. And uh, it's based on those uh, uh, things that the IT team works a lot to improve the interface. Alexander Elman, uh, Munich B. Congratulations, Vito. Uh, took a long while. Uh, we are also building models, so I know what that means globally. This is just imp incredible what you did. Uh, but putting it one step further, uh, I think these estimates we now have are the perfect basis for mitigation. So if we change buildings, vulnerabilities, what would be uh, let's say the impact. So, so how far did we come in this respect and what's the future plan in, in, in that area? In terms of continuing improving the models, you mean? Uh, no, uh, the, to, to calculate the impact of mitigation measures, things like that, and transport that in the countries? Yes, yes, very good. So obviously I've been presenting some general, I, I guess a lot of the things that I've been presenting are quite general. I feel like countries and I did not zoom in that much into the country. I can tell you that, for instance, for the exposure, we always go to the smallest administrative level, precisely for the reasons that Alex was mentioning, that the idea is not just to do something at the, um, let's say, national scale. For that, we have, for instance, a global assessment report, 2013. It provides already some um, uh, uh, estimates of risk of at least economic losses at, at the country level. We wanted to go a little bit uh, uh, deeper on that. Also, we've been having already people that basically, uh, for instance, for Central America, for the six countries in uh, Central America, not Belize, and also because of the USA-supported project, that we had the buildings as they are today, and then basically we did what you're mentioning. So let's now uh, assume that this vulnerability is going to be improved because of retrofitting measures. Let's try different scenarios in which I can magically improve the vulnerability of the entire country, or I can only improve 0.1% of the buildings each year. And we've been basically trying to understand how is the trajectory of risk and how different retrofitting techniques, because they have different performances and different costs, right? How different retrofitting techniques can affect and also basically trying to do um, a selective retrofitting because again, the retrofitting techniques have different efficiency take into account the hazard and also take into account the, uh, 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 the building classes. I will say, however, Alex, uh, despite the fact that obviously we're trying to come up with some nice examples to show, I really hope that it's going to be, you know, the other people in the world that basically, now that I have a framework, I'm going to get this, I'm going to run this, but now I'm going to use my uh, uh, retrofitting techniques or, or if it's an emergency plan or if it's better urban planning or if it's improving the soil or something like that. Um, I'd like to kind of wrap it up now. I think you want to yeah. say something, something before we do that? But We'll yes. Get a copy of it. The, okay. So uh, one thing is, as I saved the best for last, I think. So first, uh, just uh, the maps on the back. Okay. I, I think we forgot to mention there's uh, uh, um, uh, 100 maps at risk and 100 uh, uh, hazard maps. You can take them. Okay. It's uh, it's for you to take. Take many. Take many uh, for your office. You, you, there's also some rubber bands that you can use to take the maps. 
And um, uh, uh, Julia can also tell you where we have some carton tubes. In case you're going back uh, 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 by plane, you can also take some of the maps in these in this tubes to take them uh, with you. Uh, the best part for less is, of course, I want to think uh, uh, a lot the risk team. Maybe I will just ask, can the risk team just stand up so people know where you are? Okay, so whoever was already standing, you can raise your hand. <laughs> So I really, I really thank them for, for the effort. A lot of people, thank you.